And thank you, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, for inviting me to participate in this panel discussion on Lessons Learned, Leading While Black. Congresswoman, you are indeed an international leader. You have lived and survived as a refugee, and you have survived threats on your life, harassment, racism, and a well-financed attempt to defeat you in a recent election. Yet you have taken your rightful seat in the United States Congress. We should all be quiet and listen to what you have learned. However, we thank you for affording us all the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you serving on this panel. Leadership is extraordinarily challenging. Developing public policy is oftentimes very discouraging while attempting to represent the least of these. Despite the fact that there are organized forces against everything you stand for, black leadership requires understanding these forces that will work against you and still we must be committed to not being intimidated and committed to fighting the good fight and the struggle that we must have in order to protest and confront despite when the odds are seemingly against you. As was often quoted by United States Congressman Bill Clay, black leadership must understand there are no permanent friends and there are no permanent enemies, only permanent interests, quote unquote. Black leadership must understand you will be forced to make sacrifices. However, in the words of my dear friend, the Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson, if you fight, you may be able to win. But if you don't fight and put up a struggle, you will never know, quote unquote. So I applaud this panel that will be discussing these issues today. And I thank all of you for your leadership. If we are ever able to achieve justice and equality for all, we must never give up our beliefs in the fact that every human being must be treated with respect. Every human being deserves to have proper nutrition. Every human being deserves to have safe and secure housing, health care, education, the right to vote, the right to love and worship as they please. And certainly, Every human being must have the right to know and understand that they should be free of police abuse and intimidation. And of course, if we are to have all of this and any of this, this must be a guarantee by the Constitution, not only of the United States, but constitutions of democratically organized governments all over the world. And these constitutions must guarantee all human beings these rights so that we can all live, grow, and enjoy, and respect each other, and the power and influence that we have to do right by one another. So thank you all very much. Carry on. Welcome to my Congressional Black Caucus Annual Legislative Conference Panel Discussion titled, Lessons Learned Leading While Black. I would like to quickly thank Congresswoman Maxine Waters for her inspiring opening remarks and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for hosting this forum. The focus of this conversation is leadership on Black issues as Black elected officials and the intersect of being both impacted by policy as individuals, as well as, as leaders with the ability to influence the policy and outcome. I choose Black leadership for my panel and to invite the esteemed leaders assembled here today because now more than ever, representation matters. Although we are seeing an increase in representation across all levels of government, to accept this call to duty still means taking on the old burdens of inequality and injustice. As we Americans, we Americans need to do a better job of acknowledging and uplifting our extraordinary Black leaders so that young children and adults can see themselves in positions of power. 
when we support, uplift, encourage, and apply the lessons learned from one another, we start to empower our community. My panelists, no different than myself, are all of our grandparents' wildest dreams and are leading at every level of government. I want to use this platform to shine a light on their experience so that it can serve as an example for those we hope that will follow behind us. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce my panelists. Starting with my predecessor, the people's lawyer, Minnesota's one and only Attorney General, Keith Allison. Keith, please introduce yourself. Tell us what you had for breakfast this morning and the best advice you have ever been given. Well, but I, I haven't had anything for breakfast other than this coffee, but uh, it's, it's, if you can read it, it's in honor of John Lewis. So, you know, bottom line is good to have a John Lewis cup of coffee in the morning. You know, the best advice that I've ever given, I've ever received is back, don't back down and keep it on, keep on fighting. They're kind of the same thing. You know, my father used to say and still does say at 93 years old, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. You know what I mean? That's what he, he says. He's, you stay ready, you have to get ready. Because sometimes we say, you know, get ready, get ready. No, we just stay ready. We stay hot. We stay warm. We stay ready to fight whenever we need to. And so preparation is critical. And you stay, you keep in a state of, 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 of you're always reading, you're always engaging, you're always talking, you're always working. And so when the moment, the critical moment comes, you are prepared for it. So I just want to say to you, Ilhan, that I am, I couldn't be more pleased uh, with the work you're doing. I mean, when I left Congress, I was worried. What's going to happen? I ain't worried no more. You're doing an excellent job. You're doing a fine job. And I'm so, so, so uh, glad to call you my friend and colleague. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, next up, Minnesota's first Black Chairwoman of the Ways and Means Committee, State Representative Rena Moran. Rena, please introduce yourself. Tell us what you had for breakfast and the best piece of advice you have ever been given. Well, hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Rena Moran, State Representative from St. Paul, Minnesota, District 65A. Um, and I have not had breakfast today. I have not eaten today. Um, and that's usually pretty typical of me to miss a breakfast and go into lunch or dinner. Um, uh, what was the other part? I'm sorry. The best advice you have ever been given. Uh, I, I guess the, the best advice that I was given that I tried to uh, acknowledge and just stay there in that space was when I first ran. I first ran for office, not because I ever dreamed about being a politician or something that I wanted to do or decided to do. I think politics found me in my advocacy uh, around community. Um, and the advice that I was given then was just stay true, stay genuine, stay authentic, you know, and remember that what you are doing, um, and who you are representing is not just the generation before you, but the generations to come, right? That the work that you are fighting for is about your children, your grandkids, your great grandkids. And so I always try to do that to the best of my ability to, to stay genuine, to stay authentic and to always put the people first. And so, it has served me. I'm now in my sixth term in the legislature. Um, when I was elected, I was the first African American from St. Paul to represent my district at the Capitol. And here I am as chair of Ways and Means. You know, um, sometimes the universe moves and, and you have to be just ready to say, mm, you know, um, okay and just deal with whatever that okay is and to make it work. But what an honor to be here uh, as a part of this panel. Uh, Ilhan, you know, I, I see us, you know, you came in to the legislature and 
we was kind of like, you know, office mates, all right? Kind of like office mates. And, and then on the floor of the Minnesota House of Representatives, there again, were we, you know, in close proximity to each other. Um, but what an honor to see you lead and work and go into Congress, bring the people's voices into that body with you and to represent us so well. I just want to say thank you for your leadership and thank you for this moment. Um, they're all very, very much important. So thank you. Thank you, Lena. Um, next, I would like to introduce um, Minneapolis City Council Member Philippe Cunningham, uh, a great friend and an inspiring leader. Philippe, tell us what you had for breakfast and the best advice you have ever been given. Yes, uh, thank you so much for having me, Congresswoman. I feel so honored to be on such an esteemed panel. Uh, my name is Philippe Cunningham and I am the Minneapolis City Council member. I represent the fourth ward, which is in North Minneapolis. Um, I, fun fact about me is that I'm a proud pet parent, passionate about rescuing pets. And so in my home right now, we have six dogs, two cats, and I am not sorry about it. Um, yes, everybody gets those eyebrows whenever I say that. Um, so breakfast this morning, I had a homemade vegan like egg McMuffin sandwich because um, I'm a vegan. Um, I will say eating uh, regularly and balanced meals is a very important part of my self-care. Um, so, so that's what I had. And, you know, the best advice that I got uh, was when I, my mom has said this as a mantra throughout my entire life, but she started saying it when I was young. Uh, live to make yourself happy. And what she meant by that was uh, I was raised in a small, predominantly white town and I experienced a lot of anti-Blackness. Um, and I just had a really hard time with being bullied growing up. Uh, I was queer, I just didn't really fit in uh, to where the universe had plopped me in from my childhood. And she always would say, you know, you have to live your life to make yourself happy. She wanted to make sure that I felt resilient enough to not have to change who I am in order to satisfy those around me um, and adapt um, in a way to the world in a way that was actually deeply harmful to me. Um, and that has been a uh, very important advice that I've had to carry into um, being in elected office of holding true to my values, holding true to who I am, not changing who I am, um, and uh, showing up consistently and, 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 and based on principles. So, uh, so that was great advice. Thanks, mom. And uh, thank you, Congresswoman, for having me. Uh, it's, it's so fun to reflect back on our relationship because the first time I met you was at Minneapolis City Hall when you worked there. And I was uh, a fanboy at the time of all things Minneapolis City Hall. And I was so excited to meet you. By chance, Keith happened to be there that day as well as the congressman. It was just a really cool day for me as a big politics and government nerd. And um, now I'm actually in the city council office that I met you in, and uh, now I get to see you doing amazing work at uh, in the halls of Congress. We are very lucky to have you representing us and for us to have such a strong moral voice in this moment. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, and lastly, and certainly not least, Minnesota's Vice Chair of Public Safety, State Representative Cedric Frazier. Cedric, please introduce yourself. Tell us what you had for breakfast and the best advice you have ever been given. Thanks and uh, hi everybody. I'm glad to be here. Uh, for breakfast, uh, green tea, lemonade. Uh, one of my favorite drinks um, that I got a chance to have this morning. And, and you know, it was a busy morning dropping the kids off. Uh, one door at soccer practice early and then the other at our, our summer program for the day and then a meeting with uh, some of our local law enforcement leaders um, prior to this. So uh, it'll be busy after this as well. So um, best advice, uh, and, and a lot of it has been given by the folks that are on um, this, in this meeting right now. So I, I can say I appreciate that. And it has been when I stepped in or decided to say yes to step into public service, uh, don't forget why you decided to do the work and why you decided to serve and never lose yourself in the work. And also to remember that this work is bigger than you. 
which is one of the reasons why I like to be a part of it, is that it is, it is something that is bigger than myself and that the work that we are doing, we're amplifying the voices of the community and we're trying to make sure that we're making lives better for people and not worse for people. And I think that's, that's the, the best advice that I've been giving. Um, and, then, and then some advice that uh, Keith gave me right after, A.G. Ellison gave me right after I was elected was to make sure you stay close to your family, keep your priorities together. Don't ever lose touch. Don't ever lose touch of that. And I've uh, tried very hard to maintain it. It's my first year, it's been busy, but I'm trying very hard to make sure I adhere to that advice and, and take the, I take the advice very seriously. Um, and so I am very glad to be here. Congresswoman, I have followed you in your rise to, the, uh, to where you are right now uh, during my time here in Minnesota. And I was lucky enough to be a delegate when you first decided to step into the uh, role and run for uh, Congresswoman. So I was uh, proud to be a part of that moment. Uh, Council Member Cunningham, I was there when you came to cast your ballot. I was an election judge when you came to cast your ballot uh, when you first won your seat. So it's, it's been almost like a Forrest Gump thing to be around when this history is happening and to recall that. And obviously, A.G. Ellison uh, met you when I was in law school and uh, we had you to come speak to our law school. So I always appreciate that. And, and Chair Moran, you've been continuing to be a rock for me and I've always appreciated that. And I'll probably say a little bit more about that as we move forward. Um, but you've been uh, an inspiration, you've been a rock and I've been proud to see all the work that you've been doing as well. So very glad to be here on this esteemed panel. Well, thank, thank you all for um, sharing your uh, wisdom with, with our viewers. Um, I'm just thinking about the best advice I've ever been given. I think what, one really great advice I was given was um, now that I, I Keith talked about John Lewis um, was to you know he he told me um, like two months in to my service in in Congress uh, on the House floor it was a day I was doing like I had press conferences I was like running back and forth and he was he was like are you okay. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I got to go do this. And, da, da, da. and he said, pace yourself, do the most you can, um, but pace yourself. Uh, and I think for all of us, that's probably um, a really good, good advice. Uh, I, I'm just thinking about the fact that the parents here on this panel did not have breakfast <laughs> because we still haven't figured out how to pace ourselves. Um, so it, it is it is advice that I'm going to hold on to, but it's work in progress. It looks like Philippe was the only one that made time for breakfast, and um, we all we we will talk about self care a little bit later. But that's that's probably an important uh, advice for for all of us to pace ourselves and and get breakfast in the morning. Um, I wanted to to dive into um, a few questions uh, for all of you to answer, and then um, hopefully get to answer ask you one or two questions individually. The first two are, does your identity influence your perspective in uh, policy making and community leadership? And how can we as a society be more responsive and amplify the voices of Black communities? So do my identity influence my work? And I would say absolutely. And um, so identity is, you know, we talked about my, my political, as I opened up about my political life and being chair, you know, was chair of Health and Human Service, but my identity is a black woman and, and a mother. That is who I am, you know, a, a mother of seven kids. And now I have 10 grandkids. My family is growing, but that is my identity. And that really, um, influence the work, the fight, the decision-making process of how I show up at the Capitol and what's important to me uh, because race does matter. Race matters um, and decisions and policies and investment and what that looks like on like a everyday process for me starts from the vantage point of race. And from there, it is, you know, making sure that, you know, I'm making decisions around equity, you know, which is nothing more than being just and fair, 
about how we are best investing or the lack of investment that we sometimes see that so often happens um, in politics. And so um, for me, everything starts from that vantage point, you know, being a mother, you know, trying to look forward, look forward to generational change, you know, realizing that change is not going to all happen in this moment. I wish it was, <laughs> I wish it did, and I wish it could, you know, but unfortunately, you know, in politics, it doesn't. It takes generations. And so we're pushing that type of legislation that we know this is the beginning um, and for sure it's not the end. And we're gonna to continue to fight. Um, but that was a long statement, Congresswoman. I don't know what else <laughs> the rest of it was. No, that that was good. Um, anyone else who wants to chime in? Yeah, I'll jump. I'll jump in, uh, and, and I'll just say, look, you know, uh, the, the public service. It's about it's about amplifying um, the voices of the people, and it's about advocating for for the people. And I think that any time you come from a particular background or a particular community, you're going to bring those experiences with you. Look, I, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. It was a poor community. It lacked resources. Because of that, um, many of the policies that were put in place, you saw these disparate outcomes. And so my, my journey into public service and the work that I'm doing, I'm going to bring all of that with me. I'm also a father and I have three daughters. I wanna make sure that we're gonna have policies in place that are gonna be inclusive because where I came from, they weren't so inclusive. And for me, with that lens, I, I think that that helps everyone. Inclusive policies help everyone. So I'm absolutely being guided by the lived experiences that I have. And that's absolutely what we should want in any represent, representational government. We should want people from the community that have that lens so that when we're making policies, we know exactly how, we know exactly what the experiences were of those individuals, and we're more likely than not to make policy that's going to be more inclusive and more helpful of those particular communities. So I think absolutely your experiences and, and, and your race, it impacts that. Um, but ultimately, I think when you have folks that come from those backgrounds, you end up with more inclusive policies uh, and more, more inclusive laws. Cunningham? Yes, thank you for this question. Does my identity, well, for me, identities uh, influence my perceptions? Absolutely. Uh, people can scream identity politics all that they want, but that doesn't change the fact that me being Black, queer, and transgender is an asset to my governing and representation. I'm better at my job because of my intersectional lived experiences. If we are truly to achieve racial equity, then we have to be looking at the data to see who is the most impacted who, uh, by the decisions that have been made or are being made by government right now. And housing, healthcare, education, small business ownership, all across the board, Black folks are experiencing the worst outcomes. So from having lived experience of both 23 years as a Black woman and 11 years as a Black man means that I have navigated multi multiple of these experiences and, and issues from multiple perspectives. And that is an asset that I am bringing to the table. And, um, and I'm grateful for that. In order for us to be able as a society to be more responsive and amplify the voices of the Black community, I think really what we need um, is we need for more white elected officials to be able to demonstrate how to be engaged in the Black community in a way that is not tokenizing. So not hiding behind Black folks who only the ones who agree with them to be able to push forward their political agendas or their perspectives and not actually engaging with the Black folks who don't agree with them. And I'll just be honest, I think that from what I've seen, my experience, I feel like liberals are particularly bad at doing this um, in attempts to be able to look at, to seem inclusive. We have to be intentional about uh, the fact that Black folks are not a monolith whose opinions and lived experiences are solely represented by those of us who are, who are deemed respectable enough to be heard. Um, so we need to really be thinking about how are we governing? We need to be flipped from this top down to grassroots up through participatory budgeting. I really, you know, I'm, I'm a local gov government official, so I have to make a little plug saying, 
higher levels of government should be working more with local level of gov governing officials because we are so close to the people. Um, and a lot of the decisions uh, that are made are funding decisions that ultimately when it gets down to the city level, we're deciding how that money is being allocated. So there is a real iterative opportunity there for us to be governing across levels of government to be able to really uplift and be responsible, um, responsive to the black community. Yeah, I'll just say, Ilhan, uh, that obviously, you know, who I am uh, would uh, bring forth a certain set of experiences, which I bring into the work that I do. Everybody said that well. What I'll just, I'll add two little quick points to think about, but that does not mean that my advocacy and your advocacy is limited to our identity, right? So I don't have to be a senior citizen to know seniors are getting ripped off. I just, my identity as a person tells me that I'm gonna stand up for seniors. I don't have to be a white farmer from greater Minnesota to care about how, you know, some giant meat packing company is limiting their opportunity to have a viable business. I draw upon my experience and identity as the son and grandson of black farmers in Louisiana to be able to extrapolate to someone else's experience. So our identities are not really a, a, they're not a cage, they're not a limitation. What they actually are is something that get, allows us to identify with all of our constituents, the broad cross-section of our constituents. The other thing I'll say about identity is, I agree with everything everyone said, absolutely, uh, but uh, we can't let identity, we gotta understand the pitfalls of identity too. And what I mean by that, like uh, Clarence Thomas is black, y'all. You can't say he's not. He's as black as anybody on this on here. He, you would think his experience would inform him a certain way. They don't inform him that way. And I'll say, you know, Daniel Cameron, you know, who is, does the same job I do in Kentucky, had a case a lot like mine in Kentucky, and he decided to not seek justice for Breonna Taylor. We decided to seek justice for George Floyd and Dante Wright and others. So here, me and Daniel Cameron, two black men, two attorneys general, we're fighting for justice. He's fighting for that as quo. So another thing to understand about the limitations of identity, uh, as well as how we all, our identity can actually help us extrapolate beyond what some people might consider our identity to be. I mean, uh, you know, so just a few thoughts there. Thank you. I think, I think, Keith, you bring up uh, an, an important piece, right? Because identity isn't just the, the visible identity. It's everything else um, that that sort of informs our, our identity. As Rena was saying, you know, she's a mom. That's, that's part of her identity, right? Whether you grew up, um, you know, with, with wealth or not, that's part of your, your identity. Um, the neighborhood you grew up in, as Cedric was saying, that's part of your identity. Whether you are queer or not, that's part of your identity. And I think oftentimes race is the, you know, race and gender are the, the, the visible identities that people often go to. And there is so much more um, to that uh, than, you know, what meets, what meets the eye. Um, and I, I wanna talk to you a little bit about that because you, you are, I, I can say this, and, and I, I think I can speak for the rest of the panel, you're probably the reason most of us felt like it was okay for us to run for office, right? If, if you weren't a first, <laughs> um, and I know you, you bore that, that burden um, of being a first, but because of you, now Minnesota has so many uh, people who are of color elected to all levels of government. There weren't that many elected when you won um, your, your race to, to Congress and even when you served in, in the Minnesota House. Um, and, and I know that as the first Black um, Attorney General in Minnesota's history, you had to now preside over um, you, you know, you you had you had to seek justice for George Floyd, which was not just national but an international case. 
Um, but I also know that as, as, as a black man, as a black father, um, your identities informed, right? And had an impact um, on how you reacted to that, uh, to yeah. the news of George Floyd being killed and to the news of, you know, <laughs> when you were gonna have the case. But I also yeah. remember vividly watching you in a congressional hearing you testifying when Muslims, especially um, Somali Muslims, black Muslims were under yeah. the, the scope. And I remember feeling your pain because you weren't just speaking as a congressman representing Minnesota, you were also speaking as a Muslim man in this country. Uh, and so I, can you talk a little bit about that? The moments you found yourself both addressing policy issues, but also being pained by the policy decisions that um, brought you to, to those conversations. You know, I'll, I'll never forget the moment that uh, we were in that uh, Homeland Security Committee hearing. Peter King is the congressional chair. Republicans had just taken the lead. He starts saying, I'm gonna have a series of hearings on Muslims and violent extremism. I said to him privately, look, I'm not against you having hearings on violent extremism. And if you want to put some Muslims in there, you can. But talk about the white supremacists. Talk about the, the, the posse comments. Talk about it, the whole thing. Not just the Muslims. Nope, just the Muslims. In fact, after we get done with this, we're going to have about Muslims in prison, Muslims in this, Muslims here, Muslims there, Muslims everywhere. For him, it was political. For him, it was trying to make a discreet and insular minority into a villainous group that you could do anything to because they're so bad that any heap hurt you do you heap on them is a public service. That's what he's trying to do. And he's trying to create, and they've done it to people who they call them communists, and they've done it to gay people, and they've done it to they've done it to black people, they've done it to gang members. And anytime you say this group, whatever you do to them, it's fine, then Get ready because um, they don't just start with that group, they move on. And I heard so many of my Somali brothers and sisters say, they yanked me off a plane. They targeted me for it and entrapped me in a crime. They, um, they, 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 they pulled off my hijab. They called me not only the N word, but nasty words about being a Muslim. And somehow, Ilhan, I found myself in the middle of my presentation. My throat got tight. My mouth got dry and I could not keep the tears off my cheeks. It was the most involuntary thing. And I got to tell you, I was embarrassed. I was mortified and I was certain I let everyone down by going to all waterworks in that hearing. But a funny thing happened, you know, after that, um, you know, it helped, it helped bring the humanity to, to it a little bit. And I didn't see that at the time. I just felt like, what a big sloppy mess I am. And yet, um, you know, it actually helped change the conversation. What Peter King wanted to do is have the next day's headline be, Peter King valiantly rebukes and scorns the Muslims who are so bad and everybody should hate them. And what it really was is, you know, the, you know telling the story of Halat, uh, Talat Hamdani's son, a 23-year-old kid who ran into burning buildings in 9-11 to save people, Muslim immigrant, he dies. And when people can't find his body for about 10, 12 days, they're saying he was with the terrorists. It turns out he died trying to save people. And it's like, so not only does the woman lose her boy, her precious child, his reputation for, for a few days gets thrown around and, and mutilated. And then they all have to apologize. Then she's having to fight these people to get his name inscribed on the 9-11 memorial, which we, and so that is a story that really kind of did it, but it was all about the suffering, pain, and abuse that people had to, to deal with. So, you know, I can't, what I'm hearing you say, your question makes me kind of think of this. This stuff is personal, man. And every time somebody goes to Rena and says, let me tell you about how I can't afford my insulin. Right. And every time somebody goes to Cedric and says, let me, uh, Representative, tell you about how, you know, my, my nephew was wrongfully convicted. 
And anytime somebody goes to Philippe and says, you know what, um, I, I'm all for, you know, police reform, but these people are shooting up my neighborhood and I'm scared to death. And every time somebody goes to you, Ilhan, and tells you a heart-rending story about something they're going through, that's also part of our identity and experience, which allows us to stand beyond just our own limitation, which allows you as a woman to care about what's happening to some man, as allows you as a person born in Africa, in Somalia, to care about what somebody was born here is going through, allows you as a Muslim to care about what some Jew or Christian is going through. You know, and it, because this, this experience is the people pump into us as they tell us, because as you know, everybody on this call knows, part of being a good representative is being a good listener. And we absorb a lot, people. And people, I mean, Ilhan, I'm sure you've had the experience where somebody, one of your constituents says, I gotta talk to you. And you know that you do in fact need to talk to them. And your staff says, I got this, give them, give them a card. You're like, no, 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 no. Okay, let's go over here, we're gonna talk. And they tell you something that kind of blows your mind. And then that will make you absolutely dedicate yourself to fighting for $15 or more, fighting for a union, fighting for housing, fighting for whatever it is. And you're just like, this is not even cerebral. This is in the heart, not the head. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I'll hand it back. Yeah. <laughs> you're giving a sermon. <laughs> really appreciate you. And I, and, and, and I, and I, I want um, Philippe and um, Cedric to, to expand on, on this because what I heard Keith talk about and, 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 you know, to, to my question is how challenging it is uh, for us to constantly defend our humanity. And, um, and I know uh, that Philippe, you and I had this conversation where, you know, you're, you're not only speaking up on behalf of your, your constituents, right? You're not just saying North Minneapolis deserves this. You're not only saying, you know, we deserve just just policing and safety, you're also saying, see us as humans, right? And the us includes you, right? It's not just a, an, an us that is about your, your constituents, you're also speaking for yourself. And I know that um, you and Cedric have found yourselves in hearings where you, just like Keith, you were about to break down um, in and get choked up in trying to have these conversations. If you can share briefly um, what, what that feels like. Yes, it is very challenging to bring marginalized identity into systems that were not built for us to have leadership and power within them. Um, in fact, historically, they were built in order to prevent us from ha having power and access to that power. Um, and so the responsibility that we carry into these halls of power is to do what we can to dismantle the barriers of systemic racism that was baked into the system. We may have access to power, but the status quo inherently has immense power. It is, it is very challenging to be in situations uh, as a governing official to be able to have, uh, to create a baseline in which our humanity is an agreed upon reality. Like that's just a baseline. Like we don't, this is an abstract. I literally am standing in front of you as a black person who has had a black lived experience. Um, you know, and I will just say more specifically as an elected official, one of the things that has been really important for my well-being is being able to delineate who I am as a person from what my leadership represents. Um, that is, uh, has been really important. Although attacks seem personal and people try to make them personal, they're actually about what my leadership represents. I am black, queer, and trans. That alone is enough for a lot of people, but then to add my fierce advocacy and unapologetically progressive approach to governing and policy making that is a lot of change for folks who are comfort who find comfort in and benefit from the status quo um, but still 
that's what I represent through merely existing in my identities and the work that I do. That's not actually about me as a person, um, even though those who are lobbying the tax uh, are trying to make it that way. That delineation has been really critical to my well being. And at the same time, not delineating my identities. I think that that's where we have Black folks walking into positions of power and benefiting from anti Blackness for them. Uh, to access and gain more power. Um, and so it, it is hard to try to, to go into having a position of power and then just trying to convince colleagues and the broader public with a, an agreed upon baseline of shared humanity. I think just to, to add on to what Bleep's talking about, I mean, that 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 is a very challenging space to be in. And, and it is, the attacks come because you are, uh, one for me, I'm a, I'm a black man. Um, I am pushing back on things that haven't historically been pushed back. Um, I also represent a suburban district and to some of my colleagues, they don't see um, that area as, as, well, they don't see me as representing some of the issues that I am speaking directly to and pushing back on. In fact, I've had colleagues um, misstate where I'm from because of the issues that I'm speaking to. Um, I think oftentimes they think I do represent Minneapolis uh, because they've, they've, they've uh, villainized Minneapolis and the issues I speak to and push back against, they see as issues of the inner city, not as in the suburban area. Um, but this goes back to me uh, at the beginning when I said the best advice I was given is to continue to be who you are, continue to show up as who you are, and continue to advocate for the things that you um, decided to run for and, and advocate for. You know, recently I was just in, uh, I was out campaigning for someone and we were in, uh, in an apartment complex that is one of the largest, one of the largest in the state. And it's also very diverse. And listening to some of the tenants in those buildings, they clearly amplified how there are, there are two cities within one. Um, and this is in a suburban area. And they were, they were sharing with us the experiences that they're having within that area where just 10 minutes away in another part of the city, it is absolutely different from that. And when I'm in, oftentimes when I'm in meetings um, or committee meetings, and, and I, I'll just refer to one, we were at a committee meeting where we're introducing a bill around police stops, around traffic stops, uh, pretextual stops. And I shared a story that I hadn't, I hadn't thought about in years, but it was a story about where I was stopped. And it made me flash back and, and I, I paralleled it to what happened with Dante Wright. And I paralleled and I talked about how I was terrified in that moment. It was in that moment I began to get choked up because all the emotions were flooding back like it happened yesterday. You know, and I remember being terrified in that moment, not knowing what the outcome was gonna be, not knowing um, if I was gonna see family again, right? And I, I, think, I think in those moments when you can share that and you can be human and you can share, it, it absolutely, it may feel horrible in that moment. It may feel like you're not doing the right thing. You're not representing well enough, but I do think your constituents see it. Um, the broader community sees it. Um, they understand that humanity. And I also think the constituents of the, uh, probably my colleagues from other areas of the state, they also see that. And they can see that kind of fear and terrifying moment. And they say, that could have been my kid or that was me. And I absolutely understand what he's trying to do and what he's trying to represent and what he's trying to change and what he's trying to change for the better. And I believe that's gonna impact me for the better. It's not the zero sum game. It's not gonna penalize me, but it's gonna make us all better. So I, I often, every, every moment I get, every chance I get, I, I ground myself and center myself to remember that bringing that humanity, bringing who you are, it can touch everybody. It doesn't just have to be about where you are, where you're from, but that humanity, even, in, even if it's grounded in your identity and what your experiences were because of your identity or are because of your identity, it can be a tool that can facilitate that kind of inclusivity and conversation that can touch everyone and get it to a spot where we can work together and collaboratively put policies in place that are going to be inclusive of everyone, make everyone, put everyone in a better place to live. Thank you. Rina, I, I know um, it, it, you just how, how great um, and exciting it was for me to join you in the Minnesota House. Um, not, not only are we, um, uh, office mates, but I remember you telling me 
you know, you weren't just a, fir uh, a first in, in getting elected in St. Paul, but you served as the only for, for a long time um, before myself and Erin May Quaid uh, joined you. And I know that that's one thing that we all share here, that we're, we're firsts, but in, in many cases, we've been the only. Um, and I remember vividly a very powerful speech you gave on the floor when our um, Republican colleagues who were then in the majority in the Minnesota House were trying to criminalize uh, dissent. And, um, and I remember the active work that you did in trying to create the Posse Caucus um, and, you know, which I'm grateful for. Um, but I also remember you saying that it, it's, it, it's, it's not only hard to try to explain to people who you are, what you come, where you come from, what brings you to, to this position of power, but to not have others um, in, in the body that you serve and that you can lean on. And that was the reason that you were so excited to create the Posse Caucus. Can you tell us a little bit about that, that experience of being alone and then having partners and now being in, in a leadership position, chairing a committee where you have a lot of power to deal with the, the social disparities that brought you to elected office in the first place. Yeah, you're right. I am, I was really excited to see transformation happen, right? Where I was not the only black woman legislator in the Minnesota House. Um, Cause many of those you times- black, You were the only black legislator. Period, <laughs> right? Yes. Period, that's right. And I remember many of those times, um, just feeling a, a tales of two worlds, right? And how I saw solutions, how I saw the issues were often just different from my colleagues. You know, um, and it is because my experience is different. My lived experience are different, you know, and, you know, we talk a lot about historical trauma and how that trauma is passed down from generation to generation. Well, you know, if you're white, that privilege is also handed down from generation to generation, you know, and how you begin to see us as a black community, as black people, is all formed through that lens of privilege. Whether it is intended or unintended does not matter. It just is what it is. And so to begin to see like, you know, you, uh, Aaron May Quaid, you know, to see Peggy, to see Jamie, to see, you know, Mary. And although, you know, I lived experience can be different, but there are so many commonalities that is marked by the, uh, the history of America that draws us together as one. And so bringing those commonalities together as a collective so that we are speaking about those um, systems that has historically, because we're legislators, we need to talk about systems, you know, systemic racism and how that has impact or influence decision-making in that body was really, really important to me. And I think it was important to us as, as, as a group to come together collectively, you know, that we're not, no longer leaning on like, just our individual self, you know, but also we're now leading on a collective body that can influence and enhance the change that needs to happen in the body that are making decisions around our lives every single day, right? Whether that is about our education system, our health and human service, around public safety, around environment, environmental justice. You know, we wonder why so many of our kids are in our, in our community has asthma at such a high rate, why we are being disproportionately impacted by health outcomes. You know, and I want to believe that not all of that is unintentional. It is intentional. Some of those things are. And so um, 
those, uh, you know, for me, was some of those things that influenced me. Then the realization that the body that I had become a part of, that I'm like, this is really, a, we're living in two different worlds here, you know, and the things that you're, that, that are being discussed. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, it's good or bad or what it is, what it was, you know, and how important diversity is in a body of elected officials that we bring those lived experience, those, those lived um, solutions, decision making and influences into those bodies to create the change so that we are living and being a part of a more fair, just and equitable state, city, county. All of that is important when we bring the diversity into those halls of the Capitol, into the halls of city council, into the halls of our county, into the attorney general office. It is so, into Congress. Those voices and decision-making is so critical to really just creating more fair and just and equitable outcomes for all folks. And when we do well, we all do well. Yep. Thank you. I, I think that, um, I mean, you know, an another thing that, that I've, I've been um, thinking about and, and we'll, we'll close with this. I want, I want you all to give one minute responses to this is just, um, you know, obviously there is, there is the burden of being a first, there is the burden of, there, there's an opportunity, but there, it, but it, it is, it is a burden to be the only one to, to carry the hopes and dreams of, of those that share your marginalized identity. Um, and they're, they're like, sometimes it is in conflict with everything everybody else is expecting you to do that, that, that you represent, right. That has elected you. Um, and, you know, as, as we've spoken about whether it was dealing with, um, the uprising and the, you know, unearthed trauma of the murder of George Floyd or dealing with, um, you know, a lot of the disparities that 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 you are trying to address in the communities um, that that you represent, all of this can can weigh heavily on on the heart. I remember when the Muslim ban came down, all I wanted to do because I, I was I was I was so hurt by it, just lay in bed, <laughs> um, and I had to give a press conference. Keith wasn't there. I was the only other elected Muslim person in Minnesota. I had to give a press conference. I had to call on a rally. I had to do all of these things. And to be honest, to be Somali on that list um, of people who were being banned, it was hard to get out of bed, to, to feel like I could represent this country that was trying to ban people who shared my identity, right? Um, but the work goes on. We do get up, we do, we show up. Uh, and so I, I want you all to give one minute um, responses to advice that you have for, for people that that are that are struggling um, in in getting out of bed and showing up and continuing the work of fighting um, because it does get hard uh, to to do that every single day whether they're elected or they're advocates on the streets. So I'll start with Keith. One minute response. One of the burdens of leadership is that you don't get to have bad days the way everybody else does. Your strength, uh, Ilhan, has uh, impressed me on many occasions. If you didn't feel like getting out of bed, none of us knew it, because you sure didn't show it. But you're a person, and you're a human being. And sometimes when the unfair, horrible uh, attacks come, it's, it does take a toll on you. It is unnatural to be the target of so much unwarranted hostility. But that's why I pray for you, my sister, because you're carrying that with us, and uh, I just thank you for it. Keep it up. Philippe? 
Yeah, um, I definitely can relate to the not wanting to get out of bed. I experienced that um, whenever someone has died um, at the hands of Minneapolis police officers um, in our city, as well as when children are shot in my community. Um, that is that is hard. Um, one of the major game changers that I have experienced during my time in office has been um, actually working with a, a therapist who is a black therapist who specializes in racialized trauma um, because of so much of what's actually like impacting me and what's compounding is due to unresolved racialized trauma that I've accumulated in my life uh, before stepping into elected office. Um, I think that it's also really important for folks to eat enough, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, eating enough is really important, drinking enough water, uh, meditating, it sounds cheesy, but there is actually a ton of science that shows that it, it changes the structure of your brain to be more resilient to stress. Um, and so those are some of the things that have been really important, but much to uh, Attorney General Ellison's point, it's hard for us to be able to have bad days when you're in this kind of position. So you have to be able to build an infrastructure for yourself uh, to keep moving. So for me, there has been so many days of struggle of getting out the bed or saying, you know, this burden that has been put on me, take it away, right? Um, but for me, what has helped me is faith. I am a person of faith. Uh, I know that there are so many people who are praying for me, and I know the burden that is before me is the burden that I have to fight and has chosen to fight. And there is no other option. There is no other option to getting up out of your bed and going to war, because sometimes that's just what it is. Um, but faith and having good people around you that can encourage you, that can lift you up, that, that keeps you focused, that keeps you focused and moving forward for me has been that key and very dominant for me. Um, good people. Cedric. Quickly, yeah, I, I think it's, I, I lean into family, um, like, uh, like Philippe said, take care of your body, eat right, that does help with uh, managing the stress and being resilient. Um, but also, I think uh, for me on those bad days, I oftentimes I'll get a text or I'll get a phone call from someone. And then I remember that those that came before us, they didn't stop marching. <laughs> they didn't stop facing those dogs. They didn't stop facing those water hoses because what they understood was if they didn't do it, there wasn't going to be a better tomorrow for their kids or for those after them. And for me, that's the most important thing. I talked about it earlier. This is bigger than us. It's absolutely bigger than me as an individual. And if I don't get out of bed, if I have a bad day, it's like being a parent. You don't get to have a bad day. It's about making sure you do what you came to do and what you need to do so things can be better for those that are coming behind you. And so you can be an inspiration. And that's the whole idea. That's why we do the work. Thank you all. I think the, the message is center yourself. Um, continue to remind yourself of your purpose, uh, why you do this work, um, and that it it is okay to to not want to get out of bed, um, but so many people did plant the seeds that has allowed us to, to rise and we have to continue to plant seeds for others to rise. So I just um, am enormously grateful to all of you for taking the time to chat with me. I hope everyone who uh, has tuned in uh, gets to uh, have um, the kind of connection and inspiration I draw from all of you. So thank you all. Thank you, Congresswoman Omar, for that very kind introduction. Let me just start by saying what an honor it is to join all of you today. Now, I've always approached my work in Congress through a lens of racial justice, from working to dismantle systemic racism, to addressing poverty and income inequality, to ending the war on drugs. Almost all of the challenges that we face today are rooted in racial justice. And as we all know, the most effective way to solve problems is by working with those who are most impacted. Black leaders and elected officials not only have the tools to solve issues in the African-American community uh, in Black America, but we also have a responsibility 
Now, I learned that from one of my dearest mentors and guiding lights, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman elected to Congress from Brooklyn, New York. Now, I wouldn't be here speaking with you today if it weren't for her. And let me tell you, uh, I got to know her early on during her historic run for president. Few people have opened more doors for women and women of color and black women than Shirley Chisholm. Without Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm paving the way, we also would have likely not elected the first African-American as the first president of the United States or had the first black woman serving as our vice president. Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm understood that we could only make progress through electing more women, people of color, and young people, and how important it was to view policies through the lens of racial, gender, and economic justice. As a single mother on public assistance and food stamps myself, I knew I had a unique opportunity to help others, millions of others, just like me when I was elected to public office. As my sister Congresswoman Presley says, the people closest to the pain should be closest to the power. As black elected leaders, we must use our mantle to fight for our community. We represent the most underserved and overlooked communities. It's on us to make sure that our advocacy extends beyond policy. It must include a fierce demand for racial justice, and we must continue to be activists. Now more than ever, black leadership matters. We cannot recover from this pandemic without prioritizing communities of color and low-income communities, communities who have been hit the hardest by this virus. Let's continue to lead the way toward justice. Shirley Chisholm also inspired me by using her office to fight for low-income families, single moms, and immigrants, including her work creating a national school lunch program, expanding food assistance, and establishing the special supplemental nutrition program for women, infants, and children, better known as the WIC program. Today, Congresswoman Chisholm's lessons continue to inspire me in our fight for racial and economic justice and gender equality. Thank you again so much for giving me an opportunity to be with you, Congresswoman Omar.